How much is bluffing part of the game? Huge amount. So yeah, I mean, maybe actually, let me ask, like, wh what did it feel like with the live or anyone else when it's a high stake, when it's a big, when it's a big bluff? Um, so a lot of money on the table and maybe, I mean, what defines a big bluff? Maybe a lot of money on the table, but also some uncertainty in your mind and heart about like self-doubt. Well, maybe I miscalculated what's going on here, what the bets said, all that kind of stuff. Like, what does that feel like? I mean, it's, I imagine, comparable to, you know, running a, I mean, any kind of big bluff where you have a lot of something that you care about on the line. You know, so if you're bluffing in a courtroom, not that anyone should ever do that, or, yeah. you know, something equatable to that. It's, it's incredible. You know, in that scenario, you know, it was, I think it was the first time I'd ever played a 20. I'd won my way into this 25K tournament. It was, so that was the buy-in, 25,000 euros. And I had satellited my way in because it was much bigger than I would never ever normally play. And, you know, I hadn't, I wasn't that experienced at the time. And now I was sitting there against all the big boys, you know, the Negranus, the Phil Ivies and so on. Um, and then uh, to like, you know, each, each time you put the bets out, you know, you put another bet out. Your card, yeah. You know, I, I was on a what's called a semi bluff, so there were some cards that could come that would make my hand very, very strong and therefore win. But most of the time, those cards don't come. So that it's a semi bluff because you're representing. What are you representing that you already have something? So I think in this scenario, I had uh, a flush draw. Two, two. So I had two clubs. Two, two clubs came out on the flop, and then I'm hoping that on the turn and the river one will come. So I have some future equity. I could hit a club and then I'll have the best hand, in which case, great. Um, and so I can keep betting and I'll want them to call. But I've also got the other way of winning the hand where if my card doesn't come, I can keep betting and get them to fold their hand. Um, and I'm pretty sure that's what the scenario was. Um, so I had some future equity, but it's still, you know, most of the time I don't hit that club. And so I would rather him just fold because I'm, you know, the pot is now getting bigger and bigger. And in the end, like I jam all, jam all in on the river. That's my entire tournament on the line. As, as far as I'm aware, this might be the one time I ever get to play a big 25K. You know, this was the first time I played one. So it was, it felt like the most momentous thing. And this is also when I was trying to build myself up, you know, build my name, a name for myself in, in poker. I wanted so to get respect. Destroy everything for you. It felt like it in the moment. Yeah. Like, I mean, it literally does feel like a form of life and death. Like your body physiologically yeah. is having that flight or fight response. What, what are you doing with your body? What are you doing with your face? Trying are to... you just like, what are you thinking about? <laughs> uh, you... More a mixture of like, okay, what are the cards? So in theory, I'm thinking about like, okay, what are, what are cards that look make my hand look stronger? Which, are, you know, which cards hit my perceived range from his perspective, which cards don't, um, what's the right amount of bet size to, you know, maximize my fold equity in this situation. You know, that's the logical stuff that I should be thinking about. But I think in reality, because I was so scared, because there's this, at least for me, there's a certain threshold of like nervousness or stress beyond which the like logical brain shuts off. And now it just gets into this like... It just like it feels like a game of wits, basically. Yeah. It's like of, of nerve. Can you hold your hold your resolve? Um, and it certainly got by that, like by the river. This, I think, by that point, I was like, I don't even know if this is a good bluff anymore. Yeah. But fuck it, let's yeah. do it. I'm your mind is almost numb from the intensity of that feeling. I call it. I call it the white noise, and <laughs> and that's a. And it, and it happens in all kinds of decision-making. I think anything that's really, really stressful. I can, I can imagine someone in like an important job interview, if it's like a job they've always wanted and they're getting grilled, you know, like Bridgewater style where they ask these really, like, really hard like mathematical questions. You know, that's, it's a really learned skill to be able to like subdue your flight or fight response. You know, what I think get from the sympathetic into the parasympathetic so you can actually, you know, engage the, that voice in your head and do those slow logical calculations. Because evolutionarily, we, you know, if we see a lion running at us, we didn't have time to sort of calculate the lion's kinetic energy and, uh, you know, is it optimal to go this way or that way? You just reacted. And physically, our bodies are well attuned to actually make right decisions. But when you're playing a game like poker, this is not something that you ever, you know, evolved to do. And yet you're in that same flight or fight response. Um, and so that's a really important skill to be able to develop, to basically learn how to like, meditate in the moment and calm yourself so that you can think clearly. But as you were searching for a, com a comparable thing, it's interesting because you, you just made me realize that bluffing is 
like an incredibly high stakes form of lying. You're you're, you're lying, and I don't think you telling get... a story. That's, that's, it's, it's, no, no, yeah. it's straight up lying. <laughs> In in the context of game, it, we don't. It's not a negative kind of lying. It's, no, it, but it is. Yeah, exactly. You are. You're, saying, like, I, I'm. You're representing something that you don't have. And I was thinking, like, in how often in life do we have such high stakes of lying? Because I, I was thinking, um, certainly in high level military strategy, I was thinking um, when Hitler was lying to Stalin about his plans to invade the Soviet Union. Mm. And so you're 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 talking to a person like your friends, and uh, you're fighting against the enemy, whatever the, the the formulation of that enemy is. But meanwhile, whole time you're building up troops on the border. Um, that's extremely. Wait, wait. So sense. Hitler and Stalin were like pretending to be friends. Yeah. Well, my history knowledge is terrible. That's oh, yeah, crazy. Yeah, that they were. Uh, <laughs> yeah, oh, man. Uh, and it worked because Stalin until. The troops crossed the border and invaded in Operation Barbarossa, where they th this storm of Nazi troops invaded large parts of the Soviet Union, and hence one of the, the biggest wars in human history mm -hmm. uh, began. Stalin, for sure, was thought that this was uh, never going to be uh, that Hitler is not crazy enough well, to invade the Soviet Union. That they it, and it makes geopolitically makes total sense to be collaborators. And ideologically, even though there's a tension between communism and fascism or uh, national socialism, however you formulate it, it still feels like this is the right way to battle the West. Right. They, uh, they were more ideologically aligned. You know, they, they in theory had a common enemy, which yeah. was the West. So it yeah. made, made total sense. And in terms of negotiations and the way things were communicated, it uh, it seemed to Stalin that for sure that th they would remain at least for a while uh, peaceful collaborators, and uh, that uh, and everybody everybody because of that in the Soviet Union believed that it was a huge shock when Kiev was invaded, and you, you hear echoes of that when I traveled to Ukraine, sort of the shock of the invasion. It's not just the invasion on one particular border, but the invasion of the capital city. And just like, mm -hmm. holy shit! Uh, especially at that time, when you thought World War One, you realized that that was the war that, to end all wars. You would never have this kind of war. And holy shit, this this person is mad enough to try to take mm -hmm. on this monster in the Soviet Union. Uh, so it's not no longer going to be a war of hundreds of thousands dead. It'll be a war of tens of millions dead. And um, yeah, but that, like, you know, that's a very large scale kind of lie, but I'm sure there's in politics and geopolitics that kind of lying happening all the time. Uh, and a lot of people pay financially and with their lives for that kind of lying. But in our personal lives, I don't know how often we, uh, maybe we. I think people do. I mean, like, think of spouses cheating on their partners, right? And then, yeah. like, having to lie, like, where were you last night? Stuff oh, shit, like that. That's tough. Yeah. That's like, true. that's, I think. You know, I mean, that, unfortunately, that stuff happens all the time, right? Yeah. So, or having like multiple families. That one is great mm -hmm. when when each family doesn't know the other about the other one, and like maintaining that life. There, there's probably a sense of excitement about that too. Um, and, or it seems unnecessary. Yeah. But, what, why? <laughs> well, just lying, like like you know, uh, the truth ha finds a way of coming out. You know. Yes, but hence that's the thrill. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah, people. I mean, and. Uh, you know, that's, what, that's why I think actually like poker, what's, what's, what's so interesting about poker is most of the best players I know, they're always exceptions, you know, they're always bad eggs, but actually poker players are very honest people. I would say they are more honest than the average, you know, if you just took random, uh, random population sample, um, because A, you know, I think, you know, humans like to have that most people like to have some kind of, you know, mysterious, op you know, an opportunity to do something like a little mm -hmm. edgy. So we get to sort of scratch that itch of yep. being edgy at the poker exactly. table where it's like, it's part of the game. Everyone knows, everyone knows what they're in for and that's allowed. And you get to like really get that out of your system. Um, and then also like we, I, poker players learned that, you know, I'll, I, you know, I would play in a huge game 
against some of my friends, even my partner, Igor, where we will be, you know, absolutely going at each other's throats, trying to draw blood in terms of winning each money off each other and like getting under each other's skin, winding each other up, um, doing the craftiest moves we can. But then once the game's done, the, you know, the winners and the losers will go off and get a drink together and have a fun time and like talk about it in this like weird academic way afterwards because that, and that's why games are so great because you get to like live out or like, this competitive urge that, you know, most people have. 